sure. The locale of our story tonight is a Midwestern city. <laughs> I'd like to get a statement, if you don't mind. Would you mind very much if we moved out of the line of traffic? Uh, first, I'd like to ask you, uh, do you uh, plan to stick with this plea of not guilty? That's right. But you don't think that it'll make your defense a little more difficult, the fact that you skipped out on nearly $100,000 in bail money? Sure. It'll make it tougher. Do you uh, still maintain that John Chubb is alive? Yes, I have reason to believe that he is. Mr. Lennon, the day that you disappeared, now that was the very same day that Judge Brighton ruled on your affidavit of prejudice and denied your motion for a change of venue. Now, would you say that that was just coincidence? There's been a lot of speculation. I would on. not say that it was coincidence. Well, in other words, this was a deciding factor in your decision to jump bail. You bet it was. Why? Why? Because Judge Brighton is a woman. And she's emotional. All women are emotional. And I simply don't think I can get a fair trial from her. This is why you wanted to change of venue. Partly. I also know that Judge Brighton is out to get a federal appointment. She's going to pull out all the stops just to get a conviction for the record. It's her future, but it's my neck. Remain seated. Come to order. This court is now set. Will counsel stipulate prospective jurors are present and in their places, please? So stipulate, Your Honor. So stipulate, Your Honor. Proceed, Mr. Potter. I would like to excuse Mary Jane Watkins. You're excused, Mrs. Watkins, and thank you very much. Will Mary C. Charles take his place in the jury box, please? Uh, around this way. You've had prior jury duty, Mr. Charles? No, ma'am. Are you now married? Yes, ma'am. And uh, what line of business are you in, Mr. Charles? I'm a tile setter. I see. Do you work for yourself, or are you employed by someone else? I work for myself. Uh, Mr. Charles, do you have any personal or religious convictions which would prohibit you from bringing in a verdict of guilty if that verdict required the death penalty? I wouldn't like to have to do that. Ha have a man put to death on my say-so. Well, no, Mr. Charles, no one likes to do it. It is a terrible responsibility, and yet our whole system of justice depends on ordinary citizens accepting that responsibility. You know that, don't you? Yes, ma'am, I understand that. Uh, I think if I had to do it, and it's the law, well, I could do it. <laughs> Come to order. The court's now in session. Will counsel stipulate, please, that jurors are present and in their places? So stipulate, Your Honor. Stipulate, Your Honor. People versus Barry Linden. Is the defendant in the courtroom? He is, Your Honor. Are you ready to proceed, Mr. Brock? Ready for the defendant, Your Honor. Prosecution ready? Ready, Your Honor. Proceed then, Mr. Potter. Your Honor, may counsel approach the bench... Yes, you may. I have some motions here which I would like to submit at this time, and I respectfully request they be submitted in the chambers out of the presence and hearing of the jury. Very well, Mr. Brock. Court is recessed. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are admonished not to discuss the case. These are similar to the motions made previously, Mr. Brock. Motions to dismiss, change of venue, another affidavit of prejudice. Yes, Your Honor. Well, if these introduce nothing new, I will have to deny your motions as I did previously. 
Your Honor, I feel very strongly about this. How can my client get a fair and just trial when so much feeling's been stirred up against him? The press has already tried him and found him guilty. Yes, well, he'll be tried according to the evidence presented in the courtroom. We will concern ourselves with the decision of the jury, not the press. Well, counsel, stipulate that the jurors are present and in their places, please. So stipulate, so stipulate Your, Your Honor. Honor. Will the counsel waive the reading of the indictment? If it pleases the court, Your Honor, we will waive the reading of the indictment. Very well. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant is here charged with the violation of the penal code, charging him with the willful murder of one John Chubb. Counsel will be given opportunity to make an opening statement if they so desire. But I wish to point out to you that an opening statement is not to be considered as evidence. It is merely a preface, an outline of what the respective parties hope to prove. It is going to be your responsibility to decide the guilt or the innocence of this defendant based on the evidence and law as presented to you here in this courtroom. Do you wish to make your opening address, Mr. Potter? I do, Your Honor. Then proceed, please. Your Honor, counsel, ladies and gentlemen. Now, as the court has just told you, this opening statement is merely a preface, an outline of what we hope to prove. And I will attempt to be brief. Now, the state will attempt to bring these facts to your attention. First, that the defendant, Barry Linden, on or about May 15, 1955, did enter into a partnership with one John Chubb, a married man and the father of three children, residing at that time in Boulder, Colorado. And that the purpose of this partnership was to, to discover and lay claim to certain properties which might be valuable because of their content of uranium ore. Second, we hope to prove to you that these two, Lyndon and Chubb, actually did discover and lay claim to certain properties around the so-called Devil's Crater area which contained uranium ore of high quality, and that the estimates of the value of this property range from seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars. Object, Your Honor. This is hearsay and irrelevant as well as being inadmissible. I haven't yet heard the state's case, Mr. Brock, and neither has the jury. I have no way of judging this time whether it's relevant or hearsay. I still object to counsel stating things now when he knows that they will not be admissible as evidence when the time comes. Overruled. Continue, Mr. Potter. Thank you, Your Honor. Third, the state will attempt to prove to you that the defendant, Barry Linden, planned to and actually did murder his partner, John Chubb, and then bury his body somewhere out in that vast burning area of wasteland surrounding Devil's Crater, hoping to hide his crime. Object, Your Honor. Counsel will please confine his opening statement to the items he hopes to prove in court, and this would not include the inner thoughts of the defendant. Yes, Your Honor. Obviously, I have no way of recalling from personal knowledge just when Mrs. Subb filed this missing persons report. After all, our office processes over 14,000 such reports each year. Well, would it be uh, unusual, would it be unheard of to have a person just disappear from sight, leave no trace of what became of him? No, I shouldn't say it would be unusual. Happens, uh, well, every day in a city of this size, several times a day? Well, that would vary, sir, from day to day. But uh, it would not be unheard of, and it would not be unusual. Hmm? No, I should say not. And then, in other words, each year, thousands of persons disappear just as Mr. Shubb has disappeared. Well, I can't answer that, sir, because I don't know how Mr. Shubb disappeared. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Mr. Chadwick. You do not know how Mr. Shubb has disappeared. And neither does anyone else in this whole courtroom. That is precisely why Your I... Your Honor, I object on the grounds that this is argumentative. Sustained. Counsel will please refrain from arguing with the witness. That's all, Your Honor. Thank you. Can we step down, Mr. Chadwick? Is the state prepared to call its next witness? Uh, Your Honor, the state has just found a witness that has been trying to locate for some time. And uh, we respectfully request for a recess at this time so that we might bring the witness here before court convenes after lunch. Very well, Mr. Potter. Court will recess at this time and reconvene at 2 o'clock. Will the jury observe the usual admonition not to discuss this case with anyone? <laughs> has been identified as belonging to John Shubb. I'm going to ask you to look at it very closely and examine it, Mr. Uh, Hogan. 
When was the last time you saw this watch, Mr. Hogan? Uh, the last time? Yes. Uh, the day I hocked it. Oh, you pawned the watch? Where? Uh, a little hock shop uh, in El Paso. I don't remember the name. Now, how did you happen to have this watch in the first place, Mr. Hogan? Well, that's sort of a long story. Oh, we have plenty of time. It was when I was working a freighter out of Tampico. Well, we're all set to sail, and this guy comes up to me and says, how'd you like to make 20 bucks? <laughs> I says, sure. So he gives me this package and tells me to drop it overboard when we're out to sea. And did you drop it overboard? Well, I got to thinking, what could be in a box a guy is that anxious to get rid of? So I took a look-see. There was this watch, some other stuff, and an uh, empty wallet. Didn't have no money in it. Mm -hmm. What did you do with the other items, Mr. Hogan? Well, I tossed them overboard. But you kept the watch. Well, it looked like a pretty good watch. Didn't see no sense in heaving it overboard. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Hogan, I'm going to ask you to look around this courtroom and see if you can see the man who paid you $20 to throw this watch and those other items into the ocean. Now look around very carefully. That's him. The defendant? You're sure of that? No, oh, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. <laughs> And is your contention, Mr. Mosk, that this is not a bona fide signature? Yes, sir. And can you tell who traced the signature? No, sir, I cannot do that. And even Mr. Shubb could have done it, could have traced his own signature. I object, Your Honor. This is not proper cross-examination. I am only trying to clarify points made on direct examination. The witness has already testified, Mr. Brock, that anyone could trace a signature. Now, Mrs. Shubbs, I know this has been difficult for you. Uh, we, we would like to, to do anything in counsel, the world. Counsel, counsel. Mrs. Shubb, would you like to take a few minutes recess before we continue? No. No, I can go on. Very well, proceed, counsel. Mrs. Shubb, we know what you've been through. But I just want to be sure that you understand that a man's life is at stake here. Do you understand that? Would you please speak up, Mrs. Shubb, so we can get this into the record? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Shubb. Now, now, you've been here. You heard Mr. Linden testify how he won your husband's watch in a poker game out in the desert and how later he decided the best thing he could do would be to get rid of that watch after he'd been accused of your husband's murder. My husband never played a game of poker in his life. He never played a game of poker, or he never played a game of poker that you knew about? I never knew my husband to gamble. Not ever. But can you be so sure you would be willing to swear a man's life away just on the strength of it? Your Honor, I object. Sustain, counsel, do not argue with the witness, please. Honestly, Your Honor, I never knew my husband to gamble. Not ever. Yes, Mrs. Shad, the court understands that. Continue, counsel. But out there in the desert, isn't it possible that, just out of sheer boredom, he could have played a game of poker just to pass the time away, as Mr. Linden has testified? I object, Your Honor. Counsel, you've already been warned that that is argumentative. But isn't it possible for a man like your husband to have done so? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Shelby. That is all. But I never knew him to do it. Oh. Mr. Potter, have you any further questions? Uh, no more questions. Mrs. Shubb, you may step down from the stand. Your next witness, please, Mr. Potter. And I ask you, who would benefit from tracing the signature of John Shubb to that quit claim deed? There is only one person who would benefit, Barry Linden. Yes, the same Barry Linden who went into that desert with John Shubb and returned without him. The same Barry Linden who showed up with John Shubb's watch and who later says he won it in a poker game. The same Barry Linden who skipped bail and went south of the border rather than to face trial. Now I ask you, 
Is this the behavior of an innocent man? Now, when you go into that jury room, I want you to ponder this. How safe would your family be if you were to say to a man like this, it's all right to commit murder, you can get away with it, provided you're clever enough to hide the body where it won't ever be found. And I say to you that there has only been one thing proved beyond the shadow of a reasonable doubt, and that is that John Shubb is missing. Not that he has been murdered. There has been not one shred of proof that he is dead. Now, you've heard the clerk from the Bureau of Missing Persons tell you that each year over 14,000 persons are reported missing in his bureau alone. Now, this could happen to someone close to you. And when you go into that jury room, I want you to ask yourselves just one question. How safe would I be if the district attorney decided to follow up every case as he's trying to follow up this one right here? What would happen if Mr. Potter were to say to himself, John Doe is missing? He must have been murdered. Let's hang somebody who might possibly have done it. Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. And what is your verdict? We find the defendant, Barry Linden, guilty of murder in the first degree as charged in the indictment. Do you, as members of the jury, submit a recommendation for a life imprisonment? No, Your Honor, we do not. This is the verdict of each and every one of you individually. Brock, do you desire that the jury be polled? No, Your Honor. Very well. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to thank you for your time and consideration on this case. You are now dismissed. Thank you. The court wishes to make a statement at this time. First, I want it understood that I find no fault with the jury. I'm sure they gave this case their full consideration and acted in good faith. However, juries are composed of lay people not trained in the intricate complexities of our laws. And sometimes, in all good faith, they may arrive at a decision that is not in accord with the facts and with the law. When the court feels that such a situation exists, then the law allows certain alternatives, which I feel must be exercised at this moment. And therefore, the court will now entertain a motion for a new trial, Mr. Brock, Court, please. I so move, Your Honor. Motion is granted. Court's adjourned.
passenger and... Oh, how do you like that? I know I'm new around here, but I never heard that one before. Yeah, she just threw the whole case right out the window. Granted a new trial without even waiting for Linda to make an appeal. What's the use of having a jury if the judge can pull a switch like that? You just said it. She's the judge. And unless I'm mistaken, her decision's not going to be a very popular prelude to her appointment. But, hey, this might be a bigger story than I figured out. Well, let's go see if she'll make a statement. We ask you a few questions, Your Honor. Yes, come in, Mr. Baker. I rather expected you'd be around. Now, about this business of granting a new trial, uh, yes. may I ask you if there's a precedent for it? Oh, yes, there's a precedent. At least four other cases in this state alone. They're all very well marked right there in those books if you care to examine them in detail. No, thanks. I'll take your word for it. Now, I don't mean to be impertinent, Your Honor, but have you thought how this might hurt your chances for your appointment as a federal judge? Yes, indeed, I've thought about it. But you're not seriously suggesting that there's any choice between my appointment and a man's life, are you? You don't really think he's guilty, do you? Well, that's beside the point. In my opinion, he wasn't proven guilty. But, Your Honor, off the record, regardless of what was presented in the court, that man's guilty as they come and everybody knows it. Oh, no, no, Mr. Baker. Everybody doesn't know it. Everybody feels it. And feeling is emotion. Emotion has nothing to do with reason or facts or legal process. Now, you know that just as well as I do. You know, it's ironical that it was Lyndon who wanted a change of venue because, as he said, I can't get a fair trial from her. She's a woman, and all women are emotional. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree with him more there. He's right. All women are emotional. But that's not to be confused with the fact that women are not all emotion. Hmm? Can I quote that? Yes. Be my guest. Then, in your opinion, the jury's verdict was based on uh, emotion. It's a very deceiving thing, emotion. I know. I was almost swallowed up by it once myself. That was a long time ago, when I was still in law school. A uh, sex crime had been committed. And a 70-year-old maintenance man who worked in the apartment building right next to ours was picked up for questioning and... The newspapers ran a picture of him. I can still see it. It filled the whole page, just his face. And above it, there was a caption, and it read, Is this man guilty? It planted such a seed of doubt in the minds of the public that even after the criminal had confessed, and, well, the people never really believed the old man was innocent. And he died a couple months later of a broken heart. I think it was right then that I decided what the primary purpose behind my work had to be. To hold to the basic philosophy of justice in our country that an individual is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if such were the attitude outside the courtroom as well? Judge Brighton, hmm? never underestimate the power of the press. Mr. Baker. Do I detect a gleam of light in that editorial eye of yours? Could be, Your Honor, could be. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Judge not by appearance, but give just judgment. St. John, the New Testament.